through this world, faking it, knowing if someone knows who I am, that's it. Hello, Dexter Morgan fans, and welcome to the Dexter New Blood Wrap-Up Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Reynolds, writer-producer of the Showtime original series, Dexter, and now the new Showtime special event series, Dexter New Blood. That's right. Dexter is plunging back into our lives on November 7th. But before we dive into the new series, we're going to be discussing what was and what you may not have known, all with the people who do know. Thanks for joining us as we celebrate Dexter and maybe even reveal a bit about what's to come. Today, we're here with the multiple Emmy-nominated star and executive producer of Dexter New Blood, Mr. Michael C. Hall. <laughs> Everyone's going crazy. Hello. We've got Dexter showrunner and executive producer Clyde Phillips, president and our boss of Showtime Entertainment, Gary Levine. And I have a special co-host with me today, award-winning journalist, producer, and host who has spent the last decade covering Hollywood for The Hollywood Reporter, New York Magazine and Fortune, Stacy Wilson Hunt. <laughs> I've never had an intro like that. Thank you so much, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> you know, speaking of what we're here for, let's dive into America's favorite serial killer. And today we're going to talk about the cultural impact of Dexter. So Gary, your first stop, man. Looking back on Dexter, the series, a lot of people want to know how it came about, right? The, the journey from that book by Jeff Lindsay, to how it was found, how it became pilots, and then how it landed at Showtime. Sure. Well, uh, I'll take you back to the uh, early aughts when Showtime really wasn't much of a player in original series, and HBO <laughs> uh, was kind of cleaning our clock with uh, Sopranos and Sex in the City and Six Feet Under. Um, and that's when I was hired to come to Showtime to try and create a profile and put Showtime on the map in original series. Shortly thereafter, Bob Greenblatt came in, and together we started, you know, building it brick by brick. And uh, Dexter began when uh, an old colleague of Bob, Sarah Colleton, sent him the novel back in the summer of 2004. And believe it or not, we had already tried developing two serial killer shows <laughs> at Showtime. <laughs> uh, it, it felt like, you know, like virgin snow. We, we could, uh, we could uh, go, go snow, snowshoeing through. Um, and again, feeling like, you know, look, as a premium cable network, we had the, the license to explore, you know, the, the all sides of humanity, you know, the dark and the light. And I, I was determined to take full advantage of that. And you don't get much darker than a serial killer. But it proved to be an incredibly difficult target because what a serial killer does is heinous. <laughs> and, and, yeah. uh, and so we, we developed one and then decided, well, man, let's make the serial killer the best friend, <laughs> not, not the center <laughs> of the ship. And, uh, and a second one. Anyway, uh, two scripts that were in development, two scripts that never saw the light of day for good reason. And then lo and behold, arrives this novel in which Jeff Lindsay uh, licked it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and found a way to make a serial killer, uh, relatable, sympathetic, compelling. And so Sarah Colton and John Goldwyn were the producers who brought us the book. We brought in a writer, Jim Manos, to adapt the book, who was a very inventive and slightly crazy writer, which was kind of what was needed. And, uh, and, the soprano <laughs> and we developed the script along with my colleague, Perlina Ibokwe at the time, who was the serial killer uh, aficionado within Showtime, I must say. <laughs> and we got the script to a place we really liked, said, let's make the pilot. And then it became a question of, uh, you know, who can play this role? And, you know, the beauty of this portrait of this character was it went against all of the stereotypes of a serial killer. And we yeah. felt we had to go equally against type. And still our whole, you know, we were trying to raise the bar on Showtime. So one was make noise, but the other is do it with quality. And so we wanted to find, you know, the finest actor who went against type and who could play the sympathy of Dexter as well as the viciousness of Dexter. And Bob had been a producer, Bob Greenblatt had been a producer on Six Feet Under. 
which Michael obviously was one of the stars of. And I mean, his name was the first that came up and the person we fastened upon and Bob just called him. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm not sure he got a quick yes from Michael. Uh, Michael can tell you that side. But anyway, we were lucky enough to ultimately get Michael to do it. And, uh, and we went to Miami and shot the pilot in the summer of 2005 survived, I think, more than one hurricane during the course yeah, two, of that. Two hurricanes, yeah. right? And then ordered the series. Um, you know, ironically, one of the things we were trying to do at Showtime, which traditionally had done shows less expensively, so a, a show that was set in a particular place would go shoot in Toronto, no matter what, or, or Vancouver. And we had determined, no, 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 we're now going to do them properly. We're going to put the resources that are needed to really get in the game. So we were determined to shoot in Florida where, the, where it's set. But with the hurricanes, we couldn't get insurance. It became impossible. So <laughs> best of intentions, shoot it where it's supposed to be shot. We ended up shooting it in, in L.A. But then the goal was who could show run this show and really execute on the vision and give it long life and depth. And we had a great pilot at the time. And this was a gig a lot of people wanted. And we really had access to an unbelievable choice and met with several people. And the person we chose, who I had worked with before and knew how talented he was, was Clyde Phillips. And so together we marched ahead and premiered the series in the fall of 2006. And it absolutely became one of the moments that turned Showtime around. I mean, it, within a year, we had premiered Weeds and Dexter. And I think wow. those two shows are what signal to the world Showtime is for real and Showtime needs to be counted. So it was an enormous, monumental move for the network and, of course, lived on to become one of the great series of all time. I just remember when I saw the pilot, when I was working on another show, uh, we all sat around and watched it. And uh, we were like... How do we get on this show? Michael, I do want to go back to your casting. First of all, how did it feel to be top of mind for Serial Killer? Was that a compliment to you? Was it? <laughs> and then what reservations did you have about this role? Because while you, you brought so much humanity to it, it's still a Serial Killer protagonist role that could have gone very poorly. And you could have been typecast after this part. We know that that did not take place. But tell me what your reservations were, but also what excited you about this? Um, I mean, as far as being tap, typecast, I met up with a friend of mine in Central Park this morning and a woman stopped and said, are you Dexter? Are you Dexter Morgan? <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I, I maybe somewhat typecast. I mean, it'll probably be in the first paragraph, if not sentence of my obituary, but that's fine. <laughs> but um, obituaries are very in keeping with the show. So yeah, exactly. Sense, and so. I won't be around to read that anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my misgivings about taking the job were really about the fact that I just finished a five year stint on yes. Six Feet Under. And the last thing I thought I would or wanted to do was another television show. So, well, certainly I, about death, too, I, I imagine. Well, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, um, David Fisher, you know, I thought everybody thinks I'm David Fisher. In fact, you know, I was offered the role and didn't audition, but I did have to go into a hotel suite and meet with the people who. Uh, Bob Greenblatt knew me and Michael Cuesta, who's going to direct the pilot, knew me and knew me beyond just David Fisher. But I think I had to prove to to Jim Manos and Sarah Colleton and John Goldwyn that I wasn't David Fisher. Um, so I just went in there and <laughs> tried to, well, be myself, really, but um, with an awareness that I didn't want to seem too fastidious or seem like David. I, I think David <laughs> Fisher might have been Dexter's first victim. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, but but also let let's not forget you had done all that amazing stage work. I saw you in cabaret yeah. in New York. I mean, you are an actor. You aren't David Fisher. You aren't Dexter. You're an actor. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um. But I. I um. And then okay, so I didn't think I'd do another television show. But then I read the script and I was like, what am I? What am I? An asshole? Of course I'm going to try and do this. But then I took some time to just read the Darkly Dreaming Dexter, the Jeff Lindsay book, a couple times and read the script through and just think about like how, I mean, even though he was set up to be um, sympathetic and he killed other killers and, you know, if anything was going to achieve an audience uh, rooting for a serial killer, it was this. I still did take some time to just think about, okay, 
how do I imagine this working before I said yes. But once I did, uh, yeah, I was in. Again, when I saw that pilot, it took us about 10 minutes before someone suddenly went, wait a minute, that's David from Six Feet Under. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it just blew our minds because the personification, the way you stood and walked and looked, I mean, everything was different. Even though it's still Michael C. Hall, it was, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. agreed. For sure, for sure. When we were shooting the pilot, I said to Michael Cuesta, I was like, if I ever do anything that reminds you of David Fisher, tell me. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. yeah. But I have to say those two characters, and it's funny, I just rewatched Six Feet Under and Dexter in the last couple months. And they do have a lot in common in that they have a code of conduct that they mm-hmm. want to exert on the world. And, and that's where their frustrations lie, right? They each that's- are very, very caught up in protocol and there are certain ways to do things. And that's so I think true. that's something that you brought to both of the characters and, and you sell it so well too. And, and just having, you know, re-experienced both of them, it's, that really struck me. Yeah, it manifests itself differently, but they both, um, yeah, I think internally have a sort of rigidity in terms of how they imagine they ought to behave and how mm-hmm. maybe the rest of the world ought to behave. That's and, right. um, and they're both um, in, in very different ways um, repressing a great deal and both have... Right. Trauma. Have mm-hmm. uh, certain secrets that they're that they're they do. contending with, and they they solve those in very different ways. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> very. But bodies are a part of it. That's yep. true. <laughs> Dead bodies. Um, I do want to go back to a little bit of what Gary was talking about earlier. The the state of TV back in the mid two thousands. It's really interesting for me to think about when Dexter premiered. This was as Sopranos was ending but it was before Mad Men and Breaking Bad. And we're, you know, there's a lot of talk of the anti, anti-hero protagonist, the male protagonist at that point. And to me, Vince Mackey and The Shield sort of started this whole movement. But I think this interior mind, interior life that Dexter shared with us, I never thought of him as an anti-hero. I sort of thought of him as being very separate from that movement of storytelling. Scott, tell me your thoughts. Uh, yeah. Because it, it, it sort of comes from this sort of graphic novel feel at times, a comic book aesthetic that's different than The Sopranos, that's different from, you know, Mackie and all of that. Uh, a lot of times people thought, and we in the room, you know, different people in the writer's room would think of this person like Batman, you hmm. know, which he's an anti-hero, but he's a hero. And I actually so think he's more like, of a hero. I don't think he's an anti-hero. I think he's yeah. only hurting people who, quote unquote, deserve to be hurt, Right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. So I feel like that's that feeling you're talking about that it's, he's not the same as Tony Soprano, who is just flat out, you know, every time he does something nice, then he like, you know, right. punches a woman in the face. Sure. <laughs> sure. Like, it doesn't last very long, right? His moments of <laughs> yeah, yeah, things, yeah, right? yeah. And he's a criminal. But he's Dexter a Dexter carried us for yeah. like eight years, right. you know, and, and, and beyond. I think if you look at the television landscape back then, I mean, we had so many decades of sanitized characters on broadcast television that were, you know, entertaining, but lacked depth and authenticity. And I think what cable television was able to do, specifically premium cable, was to actually pull the curtain back on (laughs) on, on the flaws and warts of human beings in a way that just brought a whole new level of depth to it which I think really you could chart from that right to today as films have sort of you know, given up that and television is now the center of real character exploration. Yeah. Uh, and I think Dexter was one of the forebearers of that. And I think it is an interesting question whether Dexter is a hero or an anti-hero. I mean, I think that was part of the, the brilliance of the conceit was that on the one hand, you know, Dexter was a stone cold killer. And at Showtime, we were determined to never shy away from that. But at the same time, Dexter was a victim. Uh, you know, he'd yeah. been found in a container lying in his mother's blood for three days when he was a toddler. And that robbed him of his humanity. And the beauty of the Dexter series was watching Dexter on the outside looking in continually trying to understand it and maybe even join join the human the human race a little more and those those moments where he did were some of the best moments in the series hmm. yeah, the, you know, the, the whole notion of the anti-hero I mean people think that the conversation is that was 
eight, ten years ago and that it's over. I think that it's still very prevalent on television now. If you look at Killing Eve and Jodie Comer's character. I was just about to say, or, women get to be assholes now, too. It's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or Lupin or, or um, Ozark. I mean, Jason Bateman. I mean, it's a, an antihero to me is a sympathetic villain. Uh, right. Jason Bateman and Laura Linney um, on Ozark are monsters and completely sympathetic. Right. And I they're the kind that, of characters, too, that feel relatable. And then we have to ask us, ourselves, what would we do in their situation? And nine times out of 10, uh, I would probably do what they're doing, right? They're only acting in a practical way to save their lives, to save their families. And I think families. that's what, yeah. exactly, right. So Hoski on Hamid still, she gets to play it twice. Right. <laughs> I think maybe what makes Dexter um, not quite fit the, the anti-hero mold is that most of these other characters we're talking about are people who could have been or were once regular who moved mm. to the dark side, whereas Dexter mm. is born on the other dark side of that moon and is finding a way to come back mm. and take unique responsibility for his darkness. So in a way, they're kind of moving in opposite directions. Yeah, mm, yeah he's breaking true. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So in rewatching the show and pretty much everything we watch now, we were watching through a 2021 lens of diversity and inclusion and all the things that have become so important to storytellers, but to the business, it's now incumbent upon the business to be creating stories that reflect real life. And what's fascinating about the show is to think about 2006, you know, it was important to me and I'm sure it's important to everyone on this call, but it wasn't as much of an edict in the business, right? And yet I watch this show and it's one of the most organically inclusive and diverse shows without feeling like it's been sort of plopped in there to sort of achieve that, right? The, the Miami setting, all the amazing Latinx storylines and characters, and also representation of women. These female characters are some of the best written female characters I've ever seen on TV. Deb's potty mouth for me is one of the great highlights of television. And La Huerta and, and seeing her struggle professionally, but also she has a romantic life and she's sexual, she's beautiful. And just to see all of this going on in a way that feels so natural, I have to just say thank you for that. It's very meaningful. And then Masuka, I mean, what can we say about Masuka? So tell me a little bit about the eye toward diversity in casting, but also how you saw this evolve in, in an organic, natural way over the course of the series. And anyone can jump in. Well, right, you know, uh, we got to give Jeff Lindsay some credit here. Uh, many of these Certainly. characters were in the novel. But, you know, I, it was important for us to make the Miami part of this authentic, you know. And Miami is as big a melting pot as we have. And, yeah, and then I think the other part of it was, I mean, one of the things we like at Showtime is to have some muscularity in our characters, whether they're, you know, whatever they are. And so... It was really fun, not just to have a diverse cast, but to give Dokes the, the kind of fuel he had, to give Batista the humor he had, obviously to give Masuka the humor he had, and Deb, and, and you know, credit to Jennifer, to just make that character, I mean, every word was like, boom, you know? Uh, and she ran hot against her brother's cold, you know, which was a great contrast. So I agree. I mean, it's lovely when story and setting lead to really fully dimensional, wildly diverse characters. And I think that was one of Dexter's strengths. And tell me more on the writing side and, and also for Michael too, to be part of an ensemble like that, that was very different from Six Feet Under. Six Feet Under was very contained. It was in Pasadena or, or sorry, where did it take place in Los Angeles? But a different, you know, a different vibe, a different tone. How did it feel to expand your own acting experience to be sort of front and center with so many different actors and characters? Because it was a very big show. Um, it was great. I mean, ultimately, I think shooting in Los Angeles was good for the show, but I am glad that we did the pilot in Miami and then would go back there periodically because it is a singular place and absorbing that and, and having that continue to inform my experience of doing the show was really valuable. Um, as far as the, I mean, I, I'm just thankful to, as Gary said, the world that Jeff Lindsay created and how faithfully and ultimately more expansively rendered it was by our writers. Um, 
it was fantastic to be in a world that was that was populated by people with so much dimension, characters with so much dimension. Yeah. Michael Clyde, one of the things that works so well with Dexter is the way that he invites us in with this inner monologue that we are privy to. You know, one of the things that people say to me all the time is like, he says exactly what I think, which is problematic, but still, it's it's true, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> um, can we sort of talk about the process of, you know, writing the voiceover and how that all happens? And then also the process of like recording the voiceover and how that works on stage when we're re- when we're filming it um just the, the 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 voiceover well one of the things that i'm always asked and including this very moment is why why is a an audience inviting a serial killer into their home every sunday night for eight years and besides the fact that they want to see michael uh it's the vulnerability and humanity that he has which is reflected in his voiceover. He says things that we think, but then he acts on them in ways that we would never do it. I mean, we've all lain in bed and thought, boy, that kid that pushed my daughter off that rock, I want to go do something to his entire family. (laughs) And, but we don't, because we're not psychopaths. Dexter thinks those things. And once that person fits the code, he delivers, and there's a satisfaction for us in that. Um, I remember at the very first TCAs when we were showing the pilot, which we edited a little bit and reshot, re- rewrote and reshot a little bit of, and we were in the green room, and Matt Blank, who was the chairman, I believe, of the network at the time, Bob Greenblatt and Gary were in there, and nobody really knew how to feel about the show. They were a little nervous about what are we putting out there? What kind of message are we putting out there? And then you walk down that, that sort of black hallway, that black curtained hallway, and you see that Bill Maher television that you can see through, mm-hmm. and you can see the um, um, uh, critics watching the trailer, and Showtime makes amazing trailers. And by the time they were done watching this two-minute trailer, so we're all standing there huddled, waiting to go take our seats, they were virtually applauding. I mean, a a critic can't really applaud, but you can see they were all pleased and we had them. We got nothing but great reviews except for one, um, which was then corrected. Um, It was corrected. Wait, let's go back. Tell me about this. Yeah, Barry rewrote a review a couple of years later saying he was wrong. Um, And we were off and running. The network was behind us all the way. Um, we hired an amazing writing staff. Scott, you might want to talk about how you got on the show. Sure. And we just started putting it together. We would go to Florida. We couldn't, as Gary said, there were insurance issues in Florida, which meant you couldn't shoot after August 1st. And if you got blown away by a hurricane on August 2nd, you just had no recourse. You just lost that money. So we would shoot our exteriors down in Florida and then go back and shoot at Sunset Gower in Los Angeles as our headquarters, usually shooting down in Long Beach. I mean, L.A. looks very much like Miami. And it was great to not have to be in Miami in the summer because it's like Vietnam. It's so hot and miserable. Um, <laughs> you can tell in, some of the, in the pilot how hot everyone looks. There's oh, a lot of sweat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then continuing the thought about voiceover, Michael, performing mm-hmm. voiceover is amazing to watch you just know the moment. You know, like I've, I've worked on other shows where sometimes they have someone reading the voiceover off camera. You never need that. It's always there on your face. You want to talk about performing the secret life of Dexter for the camera? I mean, I appreciate you saying that. I I will confess that, you know, I mean, there were times in the pilot where there's some really long passages that I would memorize and literally think to myself. But then there are other times where, you know, Clyde was just talking about how we would go to Florida periodically and just get exterior shots, some yeah. which weren't even tethered to any specific moment. We just knew we'd use them. There was one time where I had some voiceover that I recorded that accompanied a shot of me just sitting and looking out at the bay eating a sandwich. And it seemed just as good and authentic as me memorizing everything and saying it to myself in my head. And sometimes I would just learn, I would maybe 
if it was a ton of material, I would reduce it or distill it to like the essential word or essential thought yeah. and just repeat that word or thought. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I know how long it needed to last and I would just count that <laughs> much time. <laughs> you know, everything, as long as you're thinking something, uh, people can project onto it whatever they might be thinking. But um. Yeah, I mean, the, the voiceover was key from the beginning. I mean, I think it's the key to why audiences identify with Dexter because they're they're subjectively experiencing the show and experiencing the world. They're in on his innermost thoughts. They're in on the secrets that no one else in this world. And they're kind of implicated as a result. Like you're, yeah. you're, you're, oh, I'm inside his head. Okay, well, I guess we're doing this, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and... Yeah, I record like scratch versions of the voiceover over the course of shooting. And those are put into preliminary edits or assemblies of the episodes. And then when we go in and do the final ADR session, along with cleaning up any lines where airplanes fly overhead or whatever, I re-record re all the voiceover lines to picture so I can really make sure they just tuck right into the right moment. Yeah. Sometimes if a change in thought is accompanied by just a, a blink or, a, or a, you know, it, it can really go a long way to making it feel that much more intimate and like his living thought, you know. The other thing, I, I have to say that Michael found a way into that voiceover. You know, Michael, I mean, it's Michael's voice, right? Yeah. And yet Dexter's inner voice is different than Dexter's outer voice. That's right. And it's a remarkable feat that it's the same actor voicing it. And yet one feels like it's coming from this internal, mm. you know, more subliminal place. And the other is much more, you know, outfacing. And even at the table reads, Michael would create the distinction. And uh, it was incredible. I mean, so it, it, it wasn't just voiceover. It, it was also Michael's approach to the voiceover that I think sold it. I just want to ask Michael a question. Um, when you're doing, the, I've done several voiceover shows and they've all, other than this one, have had uh, off-camera actor reading the lines so everybody knows the timing and everything. Do you find that guest actors and guest directors have to make an adjustment to the way you do it because they don't know the timing the way you know the timing? Yeah, I think sometimes I'll have to remind a director, just make sure they remember that they need to leave what might feel like a more generous than necessary pause just for their own editing purposes so that we're able to tuck that in. I think the biggest challenge sometimes is for, I know both uh, Clancy and Julia in this new version, um, Clancy was, <laughs> Clancy would be like, oh, oh, right, right. You're going to do your thing there, right? <laughs> he would call it my thing. Uh, and Julia, like she, I think that you can even, if you watch the show, you know, early on, like I would have a voiceover and I'd look away just because I knew the camera would be on me and we'd see him kind of have this private thought that's sort of in real time, but maybe a little bit out of time. And then, but, but she was like, I can't stand it when you look away from me like that. I'm like, what is he thinking? What is he doing? Is he a serial killer? Like all this, you know, um, of course she doesn't know that. So um, there are later in the season, I think some moments where I have a voiceover and I'm just looking her dead in the eyes. <laughs> just like, just like, all right, I'm faking my voiceover, but I'm not breaking eye contact with you. But, but I, I'm, I sympathize, you know, it's a weird thing, sort of seemingly awkward and maybe even implausible feeling pauses that actors have to take in scenes with Dexter. But um. Yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the things to, for that people should listen to as they're rewatching the last eight seasons of Dexter is the way that as Dexter gets closer, more open to people about who he really is, the, the serial killer part of himself, that voiceover starts to come out as he talks to people. You start to hear the inside outside. It's a very subtle thing that you do, Michael, but it's a way that we all it makes us all sort of lean in like, oh, wow. They're you in trust the that truth person. That yeah. yeah, and the trust and everything. Mm -hmm. And I noticed yeah. that just even rewatching the final season, his interactions with Hannah, because yeah. she was on that of that mindset, or at least appreciated it in her own special way, yeah. that his guard was definitely down, and and he communicated the same way he would to us, which I thought was really interesting, very in keeping with what you were just saying. And we um, have less voiceover too. 
So right. yeah, but we exactly. have less voiceover because now he doesn't have to share anything. Exactly. Anyway. And I'd also love to pose another question to the group in terms of the big moments in the show. And for me, season four was a real turning point. Seeing my beloved John Lithgow be so incredibly disturbing and so scary in that season, I still have not recovered from that season. But what struck me about that season was that we met the killer in the first episode, that scene in the bathtub, where normally we would find out who the killer is at the end of the season. We met him in the first episode. So tell me a little bit about season four and and to what degree you saw that also as a turning point. And then let's talk about the decision to kill off a lot of major characters. That is a huge boon to the show. And Rita, we'll get to her in a moment, but again, still haven't recovered from that. So Scott, tell me a little bit about season four and also the decisions to kill off these. Some of them are very beloved characters. Yeah. Um, As far as how we sort of shaped a season, we would always, we'd go, what is Dexter dealing with, right? Uh, Season two is can Dexter have a girlfriend, right? We Hmm. dove into that headlong. Season three, can Dexter have a friend? (laughs) And uh, that knows everything about him. And we, you know, with Jimmy Smits and how wonderful he was uh, and what a great foil and friend he became. And in season four, uh, we were like, Dexter seems to be in his quest to become more human, sort of. He's being drawn toward this family life with Rita and the two kids. Right. So it was... And baby Harrison at that point. And and his own baby. Right. And his own baby. That's right. And his own baby. So it was like, can Dexter have a family? Can Dexter be a father? Can a serial Mm -hmm. killer who has these thoughts in these aggressive ways uh, (laughs) find a way to have a family? And that's how that happened. Hmm. Um, Yeah, the first first episode of that season... um, was called Living the Dream. Right, and we I remember. Opened, mm-hmm. We opened with uh, Dexter and his family and his baby living in suburbia, not in his apartment anymore. And can he possibly, is there a shelf life to being a serial killer? And are there exceptions? So we wanted to show the exception. I wrote that episode. We wanted mm-hmm. to show the- Very well done. We wanted to show the exception right away. And- we kind of did a Silence of the Lambs mislead, thinking that Dexter was heading to a house where he was going to do a kill, and it turns out to be uh, John Lithgow in that bathtub scene. And of course, so John, on his, yeah. mm-hmm. John on his first day of work for us was naked the whole day. He was in <laughs> he was in the bathtub doing that scene, and then he went into the shower for that hot self-flagellation. Yes. Um, and then he put on a bathrobe and sat down and read a newspaper until he was called again. It was a hazing ritual that Michael insisted upon for all his co-stars. <laughs> and John no, I remember in the room John when, uh, when John Lithgow came up as a possibility, even, there was some folks in the writer's room that were like, are you kidding me? The guy from Third Rock from the Sun? Because right. that was his persona at that point. It was this big comedy guy, big, broad, fun comedy. And uh, I promptly whipped out Brian De Palma's blowout and showed him as a liberty killer. And they're like, oh. And, yeah, and he did Raising Cane, man. too, didn't, didn't he? he was yeah, in another, Raising Cane. Yeah. <laughs> and World According to Garp, for, for which oh. he was nominated for an Oscar. He's, he's so, so how, incredible. Yeah, how was that working with John Lithgow, Michael? Like, what a... A fellow stage guy, too, right? Like, he, he nice loves stage guy. as much as you. Yeah. Uh, it was incredible. I mean, it was one of the highlights. I was asked to say something about him when he was um, recently honored by the... Um, Television Academy. And, you know, I think uh, along with his formidable talents and, you know, the fact that he's just a, a titan, he has such a sense of play about the way he approaches everything. Everything's just, um, I mean, very, very deep, very, very serious, but play. And we would, um, I remember doing that Thanksgiving episode where he, yes. uh, where he breaks his son's finger and says, shut up, cunt, to his wife, and <laughs> really just reveals the extent of that dysfunction and that darkness and doing scenes with him and just bursting into hysterical laughter when we say cut at just, I don't know, this is the, the glee. I don't know. He would just constantly remind me of what a gift it is to be called upon and employed to just pretend and play deeply, you know? And um, he had that genuine spirit, has still. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. 
every season seemed to take us to new heights. And in fact, the audience grew every season uh, wow. of Dexter, which is, uh, which is a <laughs> remarkable thing. That's huge. Um, yeah, and there's no question season four was a special one. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say uh, the only one. <laughs> Obviously so not the ones, only but, one. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty amazing. And also because of, as Scott said, you know, the, the way in was Dexter is dad. Dexter is suburban dad. It's like, what? And that track, along with the most brutal, <laughs> vicious, you know, killers uh, battling each other. It, it just showed the range of this show in such stark relief. As far as, um, I just want to hear like the Showtime point of view about all this. Like, so we did, we, we did kill off, just bringing back your question, Stacey, mm-hmm. we did kill sure. off a lot of characters, like a lot of major characters, which wasn't something that happened on television. You know, you, you just that point. keep going and yeah. going and going, mm-hmm. you know, between Dokes in season two, you know, which happened just because we carried that relationship as far as we possibly could to, uh, uh, who else? Rita. Lundy. And Lundy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lila. Um, yeah, Lila. Oh, yeah, at the end of season two with Lila. And, uh, yep. I mean, it, pretty much every big bad found their ending. But even mm-hmm. just like the good guys uh, mm-hmm. lost Huerta, their lives. Too. Mm-hmm. That's right, La Guerta. Um, mm-hmm. What was that yeah. like? Was mm-hmm. there... Was there, especially with like Rita, which I feel like Oof. was the one that most people said, I felt like I was punched in the gut. That was rough. <laughs> when, just like with Dexter, as he walked in that room. I um, want to talk about like that process and hearing these things. And Yeah, look, <clears throat> I do think one of the things we can do is present reality, <laughs> you know, in very real ways. And, uh, you know, if you're doing a show about serial killers, you've got to embrace killing. And uh, the the good news is there are many other elements of the show, many other colors, but we never wanted to shy away from the fact that, you know, people would die in this series. And when Dexter is coming up against other serial killers, when you're talking about police officers, you know, I think it goes with the territory. So we embraced it. I mean, look, I, I will say the scariest time for me on, on Dexter and really all of our series was the first meeting of a new season, you know, because it was, it was like, wow, they nailed that season before they ended it in the most dramatic way. They painted themselves into such ridiculous corners. How the hell are they ever going to get out of it? How the hell are we ever going to, to match what took place before or hopefully even top it? And so I would go into those meetings with uh, with a knot in my stomach, you know, and leave in, enormously excited, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, high risk, high reward is, I guess, the way I would uh, summarize it. And so on that front, uh, for the writers, what kind of notes were you getting from Showtime during this time? This is your, your time to air your grievances about Gary's <laughs> notes over the years. <laughs> um, yeah, well, Gary and I have known each other from, since the, f- the first day he moved to California. <laughs> and I've always felt free to speak my mind, and he, Lord knows he feels free to speak his. <laughs> yes, and, that's his, that's his and, job, in fact, yes. Right. And in fact, there were never really huge disagreements. There were discussions, or if Gary had a very strong feeling about why something doesn't work, we would go back and try to make it work, whether we agreed or not. And then most, more often than not, we would always go back and say, okay, what's the note behind the note? Mm. Um, why is he feeling this rather than this objective thing that's sitting in front of him? And we would go back and dig a little deeper. I remember on the Thanksgiving episode, we had done a table read. We were going to start shooting on Tuesday and Friday night. We got a phone call from Gary and Bob saying, you know what? We know we gave you a table read. We know we approved everything. We're really sorry to do this, but (laughs) this could be, this show could be crazier. Um, this could really be Tennessee Williams. We have a chance here. And uh, we, we know we've approved everything. And if you got it schedule-wise, just do it, then do it. Um, and we said, no, no, let us think about it. And then it was, and then it was a Friday night. We all walked down the hall <laughs> and, uh, and started spitballing ideas. Scott, who is an idea machine to the point where you want to hit him in the head with a mallet, um, <laughs> but he says, he says, okay, how about this? Okay, no. Okay, how about this? How about this? Great one. Um, And then we went in on Saturday, the whole writing staff, 
it was kind of like the front page. Everybody's running around with pages and, and taking scenes. And then on Sunday, it was Scott and me and Melissa. Oh, and Scott Buck. It's and Melissa Rosenberg, did, right? Melissa Rosenberg. Melissa yeah. Rosenberg. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. And we started putting it together and then running it through my computer. And then at the end of the day and late on a Sunday night, Melissa Rosenberg comes into my office and says, wait, 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 I have one more idea for the, for the dinner scene. And she pitched it to me and we acted it out actually. And this was yeah. Dexter, uh, Michael, this is when you drag Trinity into the kitchen by the neck and the whole family jumps on you. And we can see, boy, this is bigger than I can handle. The whole family still believes in this guy. Um, and we, so we took that scene and added it to what we thought we had once again finished, did it, sent it to the network that night and they loved it, and we ended up with a classic episode. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it was, um, first of all, it was fun to do. It was one of those times where we got hit with a really hard note, and the note behind the note was, look, we all want to make this better, and hmm. there's, there's still some room here. We haven't reached the cap. Let's reach the cap, and that's what we did that weekend. Well, it helps when the execs are huge fans of the show. And they actually really care, right? Yeah, sure. That's why we got the phone call. If it was a show that was just a bubble show for them, they, would, they wouldn't have put in the effort to ask us to put in the effort. Hmm. It's good. They pushed you. <laughs> sure. And Clyde and Scott, I would love for you to talk about, from the writing perspective, the infusion of humor into the show. There are some very genuinely very funny moments. I, the, the episode where Dexter goes to his high school reunion and he's in the lab and the nice young woman, you know, gives him a, a, a thank you gift in, in the chemistry lab. Those moments, <laughs> that was not a scene that we needed in the show. And yet it was hilarious. And also watching Dexter try to dance to the MC Hammer. I, some of these, I, I'm just <laughs> laughing thinking about it right now. So tell me how you balance the levity with this very dark material. Well, I think that the levity leavens the gravitas of the show. And quite often, we will think of something that's just ironic. Like in the first episode that we did this year, somebody is waving a knife at Dexter. And, and, says, well, and Dexter flinches and says, cut that out. And uh, the other person says, what, you got a problem, Boy Scout? And Dexter says, well, I kind of have a thing about blood. And so, I mean, that's, that's a little uh, nugget for, for the audience to enjoy. Often, um, we will be editing, it, it, just to kind of tell you what it's like remotely, because we're all working remotely these days as so we are doing this podcast. Um, we'll be watching a cut and we'll think, you know, there's a little pause there and there's a moment where Dexter could get in something that's on point and uh, a wink and a nod to the audience, be humorous and make the scene more complex. And again, with just how remarkable it is, I will then, we'll be in, a, in an editing session and I'll then pick up my iPhone and record something, send it to the editor to see if it fits all in all real time. And then she'll send it to Michael. And if he approves it, he will record it. And by the end of the day, we'll have it back in the show. So it's, it's an extraordinary process. And, and I think it helps differentiate this show. I mean, you, you don't think of, the Sopranos or Mad Men or Breaking Bad or The Wire or any of those shows as I can't think of one joke in the whole, in the whole show other than the famous uh, scene in The Wire when they're examining that kitchen and the only word that the two cops are saying is fuck, but they're saying it with different inflections. Yeah. And they say it about 50 times. I just watched that right. recently too. Right. Then they find the bullet in the refrigerator. And I mean, that's the only one I can think of in all of those shows. And we had our we had our own with uh, the way that uh, Eric King as Dokes did surprise motherfucker, like <laughs> how that then became a meme and it was right. <laughs> like I still get that once a week someone sends me that <laughs> right this, this, this thing with the eyes yeah. I'm watching you uh, Michael do you have any like just real quick uh, favorite moments over the years. And then how that sort of affected as you stepped into the role once again in this with the with Dexter New Blood. Um, Outside of Thanksgiving, which we know, right? Was yeah, a lot, Thanksgiving. Which was, was a lot Thanksgiving. 
I always loved uh, Dexter's face plant into the blood uh, <laughs> when he comes into the hotel room hotel, and has his yeah. uh, has his flashback uh, and, and remembers consciously his origin story. Um, <laughs> it was a fun stunt. I felt like I was on a gory slip and slide. It was just a great moment for the character. Um, I always loved um, that that moment talking about comic moments when Dexter kills Rita's ex-husband with the frying oh, pan yeah. and, um, <laughs> and, and, and makes that, um, that sort of grimace. Um, know, yeah. It felt that, but, oh man, I mean, the again, rooftop, that, the, that, that like everybody in the audience was like, yes, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, um, the, uh, the rooftop scene with, um, Miguel Prado with Jimmy oh, yeah. Smith's mm. is always, um, uh, I mean, there's so many. There's so many. He was um, Jimmy Smith was so intense. Like no yeah. one wanted to sit next to him during read-throughs because a he's a giant. <laughs> he's B, very tall. He just would swing his arms around as he would. I mean, he gave 110 percent at every read-through and just yeah. spitting and everything. And uh, you'd have to duck. Is the only read-through where you had to duck <laughs> and not get <laughs> swatted. Yeah. I mean, that was. It was always fun to pretend that I was someone whose heart rate wouldn't go up a beat when someone like Jimmy was like doing that yeah. into my yeah. face. I mean, that's fun. It's fun to, to get to pretend that you're that much of a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that you're that, like that kind of thing actually slows your heart down. Yeah. So Michael, you know, in the, in the course of the earlier season when we were together, because we were writing and shooting at the same time and you were, you knew you were building toward the big, bad, big, bad ending. Right. You, you would become more and more intense as the year went on. Naturally <laughs> this season with all the scripts written and shooting so out of order. Yeah. Um, it, I, I found you to be a, a very different actor, person and friend where you were always approachable yeah, it was a very different experience doing this new version because of what you said. I mean, we had all the scripts written, which is a unique situation, and we were shooting it as if it were COVID. Yeah, and we were shooting it as if as if right, right. Yeah, and we were shooting as if it were a ten-hour movie, and. Um, so I think a part of what would sometimes happen in the more traditionally shot seasons is that the window gets more and more narrow between, you know, what you're shooting and what's on the horizon in terms of what's been written. And there's a increasing anxiety about not what's going to happen, because I think I'd, I would know what was going to happen, but exactly how it was going to happen. And um, basically, yes, I think you're <laughs> I think you're right. I think I probably enjoyed having the whole of it, I mean, it was very challenging to shoot it out of order, but it was actually luxurious to have it all kind of in my head from the get-go. <laughs> and, and Clyde and Scott, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your biggest tropes to avoid in a reboot experience. We've seen a lot of reboots in the last decade. Some of them are done very well, some of them are not. What were you wanting to avoid with this iteration? And what most excited you about diving back into this story? Uh, I was just going to quote Michael, uh, who, when we first met on doing this um, revival, he said, the one thing that it cannot be is Dexter season nine. We have to acknowledge the fact that almost a decade has passed. Right. Fans are different. Fans watch television differently. Um, <clears throat> we need to acknowledge that. We need to bring in new fans. I mean, there are millions of fans that we're going after that uh, weren't old enough to experience the original Dexter and are now watching it. But also we didn't have Instagram and Twitter too when the show premiered. I mean, the entire sure. landscape of fan interaction just, it just bears no resemblance to 2006. No, when, when we dropped the trailer, uh, or when Showtime dropped the trailer, within two days, it had three million hits on YouTube. Wow. Uh, how else can you communicate like that um, yeah. other than that? And then also a lot of what we wrote this year reflects What's going on now? We address global warming. We address mm -hmm. the opioid crisis. We address school shootings. Um, we, we address somebody having uh, to learn how to become a parent. So we acknowledge 
in all regards that a, a decade has passed. Uh, the diversity of the show, once again, I think, is reflective of society. There is one shot, every time we look at it in the edit, uh, there's one shot that Michael's not even in, that in which there's uh, a black man, a native woman, an Asian woman, and a disabled woman in a wheelchair. And it's completely natural and befitting to where we are now and particularly to where Dexter is and, and where the show is. And one of the, as far as like creating Dexter New Blood, uh, we had to fight our own instincts as writers to not like create lots of mini big bads and have lots of kills. Like we used to, you know, back in the day, we would have, you know, it'd be 12 episodes and there'd be like seven to eight little big bads and then the big bad, you know? Right. It was more um, procedural too. And you can't really do that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he's not, he's not, he's, he's not a cop. He's not doing any of these sort of things, you know? Um, and we, and just grounding it in character and grounding it in this relationship between Dexter and, and Harrison. And uh, that was sort of our driving force all the way through. Mm. Well, and Michael, and talk a little bit about just, first of all, revisiting a character you had already played more than a decade ago, but also taking this on during COVID, one of the mm -hmm. most difficult times for artists <laughs> to sort of stay sharp, to jump back into their work after months of not being able to work. So there was sort of a two-pronged challenge, revisiting a character, but then having gone through what we've all gone through in the last year, what, what has that been like for you? Um, it was great. It was definitely grueling. I think Clyde mentioned, I think we had a 119 day shoot in 52 locations and some of them were very um, logistically challenging and challenging because of weather and because of rain and flooding and mud and who knows what. And I mean, I definitely, as far as the COVID of it all goes, the, the real lion's share of that burden is on the crew, you know, because they had to do all of this with a mask on their face. Wow. every day for you know we uh by necessity had to take them off <laughs> right, uh, right and and got the luxury of um i mean we were very still much in the thick of the COVID of it all when we went and did camera tests right before we started shooting and i went into that sound stage and took my mask off in a room full of people and i was like wow i think that's the first time i've done that and i don't know how long so in that sense it was kind of a Luxury, And it was also nice to, um, you know, well, we're simulating a guy whose life is somewhat complicated and its own kind of stressful. It was actually really nice to, in the midst of all the storm and stress of everything that defines the world these days, to go in and focus on some sort of relatively contained fictional story that we were all trying to make happen and you know, have something that you had some control over rather than, you know, just fixating on, on the, all the things that we can't really control in this world. So in that, in that sense, it was nice. And returning to it was very strange. I mean, he was still there, you know. I would find myself just kind of breathing in ways or moving in ways that felt kind of like, oh, yeah, that's him. As far as the whole cellular regeneration thing, uh, that, I guess it's uh, seven years for everything. Right. I, the, the, I was, <laughs> I am, I am materially a completely different person, but um, <laughs> but he's still in there. <laughs> he's still in there. <laughs> there you have it. Um, listen, so everybody that's listening to this, make sure you got Showtime because that's where you watch Dexter, and that's where on November seventh you will watch Dexter: New Blood. Thank you, Clyde Phillips, showrunner. Thank you, Michael C. Hall. Star Dexter. Woo. Thank you, uh, Gary Levine. And thank you uh, this week, my special co-host, Stacy, for uh, coming on board this thing. Uh, and that's a, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Uh, listen every Tuesday and subscribe to Dexter New Blood Wrap Up wherever you get your podcasts. And watch Dexter New Blood Sunday starting, when is it again, Gary? It's November 7th. That. November 7th. <laughs> Only on Showtime. Thanks for listening, everybody.